Hello. In this video, we're going to be setting up the role-playing game data classes that we've been talking about in the last couple PowerPoint presentations. We'll be addressing a number of topics here, and we'll, I'll be trying to comment in the code as they go. We'll be doing some basic um, interaction between objects, but we're not focusing at all in this in terms of graphics or setup in that sense. I want you to bear in mind as we go through this, there are, of course, different ways to approach this and better ways in some contexts to approach this to achieve other ends. But what we're interested in here is really highlighting some core ideas surrounding object-oriented orient design. So let's start by reminding yourself what our basic hierarchy looked like. We decided that in our game we would have a wizard class and we'd have a barbarian class, and the super class that would connect those would be the player class. So the first thing we're going to do is set up those three classes. So we're going to create a new class. I'm going to create a class called player. There's my player class. I'm going to create a new class. I will call that class wizard. Let's drag this down so you can see it. And I'm going to create a third class, and I'm going to call this class barbarian. Now, if we take a look at this diagram, we see that a wizard is a player. A barbarian is a player. So this is where we need to make wizard a subclass of player and barbarian a subclass of player. To do that in Java, we use the extends command. So barbarian extends player, and we come to wizard, wizard extends player, and now we've set up the hierarchy based on this diagram here. Remember, though player has no explicit extends statement here, what is here by default is extends object. Object is the root of the Java hierarchy, and so if, if a class is not does not explicitly extend another one, object is, is what it connects to. But we typically don't write that. We're going to make a third class here called, called Game Runner, and we will include a main method in there, and, and we're going to do some testing here. So by setting up this hierarchy, what I can now do is I can make a player p1 equals new player. I can make a wizard w1 equals new wizard. I can make a barbarian b1 equals new barbarian. And so I can instantiate each of those objects. Now what the hierarchy does and allows us to do is remember up to this point in all our programming the reference type and so remember it's always reference type equals new and then it's object type the reference type is always matched the object type. And we really want to now start distinguishing between the reference type and the object type because we can actually set up a situation where they don't match. And the rule is, is that the reference must always be the same as the object type. Or a more general type. And in our video, we talked about one way to remember that is to think about general to specific. So I could go player p2 equals new wizard, player p3 equals new barbarian. Those are both valid lines. This first one has a player reference and a wizard which points to a wizard object, a player reference which points to a barbarian object. This is a very useful technique. It always comes up in a conversation, well why is this beneficial? Well it's hard to dive into the, the depths of this right now, but one, one reason this is useful right now is let's say you're designing a larger game and in that game, you can take a party, which is a combination of wizards and barbarians. You might store this party in, say, an array of objects or an array list of objects, so some form of data structure. Now, it, it becomes challenging if you want a combination of these two different classes. So I want, say, two wizards and two barbarians, or a bar one wizard and three barbarians, whatever the combination might be. But by making an array, for example, of type player, oops, what I can now do is I can say
So now what I can do is in this data structure, because the reference is a more generic type to this data structure, I can actually place a combination of subclasses in there, which will allow for some interesting things to be done later on. Same idea works. Let's A little later, we're going to write a method called fight. And it's going to be a void method. And what it's going to do is simulate a fight between two players in our game. Well, if we think about what are the combinations that could happen, we could have a wizard fight a wizard. We could have a barbarian fight a barbarian. We could have a wizard fight a barbarian. So we have three different combinations. And that's, we have to think about permutations as well, perhaps, if we're passing things into this method to, to simulate this fight sequence. So am I going to make a number of my methods called fight with different parameters? What I can do is I can make the parameters of that more generic object type. And so that means when I invoke this method, and we'll just for now put it here. When I invoke this method, what this gives me the ability to do is pass in here whatever I want. I could pass in wizards or barbarians and then manage the behavior. So that's perfectly fine. I'm going to have B1 fight W1, perfectly valid. I could have W1 equals B1, perfectly valid. I could have B1 fight themselves. The point I'm trying to make here is that by having the reference to be a more generic type than the object type, what that allows me to do is to set a parameter or set a data structure and then contain any of the, any of the subclasses. It allows for some very versatile programming techniques. So the big takeaway is you always want to think about an object in terms of the reference type and the object type. And for now, we're just going to keep this in the back of our head as it will have some more significant impacts a little later on. So let me delete that right now. Okay, so if we look at our design here, we see that all players have hit points, which is going to store the power that a player contains. Wizards have a circle and mana. Barbarians have a clan and power. So we're going to come into our class here and we're going to put the appropriate fields in here. We are going to encapsulate them. For now, I'm just going to default hit points to 100. Wizard, I'm going to default mana to 100. And I'm sure everyone knows this, but mana is a, is a measurement of the magical power that a, that a wizard has. It's just common knowledge, I'm sure. I knew I forgot that, forgot my variable type. We'll just default all of these to 100 right now. So private, string, clan. Right now we won't put anything in clan. Private, string, circle. Right now we just won't put anything in it. And again, so wizards have a wizard object. Even though we have two, uh, two fields here, it actually has three fields. It's going to have hit points, mana, circle, because wizard would inherit hit points from player. Barbarians, though, though showing only two fields here, actually has three fields. It's going to have hit points, power, and clan. The common elements to wizards and barbarians are put inside the player class. So the way our game is designed is that if wizards have mana, they can do a magic attack, which would result in some, some amount of damage. If barbarians have power, they can do some special attack, which would result in some form of power. But if, if wizards don't have mana and barbarians don't have power, they're going to have a common type of attack. Now, because that behavior is common and the same to both wizards and barbarian, we would put that inside the player class because that is the super class. By placing a method, method in here called attack, and again, this is a very simple method that prints out player attacking uh, and returns a random number, which will represent our damage. Um, because it's common, we put it up here. What's important to note that, again, even though when I look at the wizard class and it looks like it has no methods, because wizard extends player, it inherits attack. Barbarian, because it extends player, it inherits attack. So if I come to Game Runner now, you'll see that I've, I've taken this first player, P1 equals new player object, wizard W1 equals new wizard object, and barbarian B1 equals new barbarian object. And down here, I'm able to invoke the attack method for each of them. And so what happens is with the player object, which is P1, 
It goes right into the player class, uses the version of attack that exists, and executes it. So if I run this, I will get player attack. Wizard 1, it's going to start looking in the wizard class. It won't find the attack method and then move up to the player class and try and find that version. We always start looking for the specific method at the object types class level. And the same behavior with the barbarian. So even though this is a player, this is a wizard, and this is a barbarian, they're all going to execute the same attack method. So notice player attacking, player attacking, player attacking. Now, perhaps, like I said, or what we want is we want the wizard and barbarian to have their own unique version of attack that is executed given certain circumstances. So if I come into wizard here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to include the attack method as well. But instead of saying player attacking, I'm going to put wizard attacking. And if a wizard attacks, we're going to assume it's a magical attack, so we're going to increase the amount of damage that can be done. Likewise, I'm going to include in the barbarian class their own version of attack, and it's going to say barbarian attacking. Again, I think in my PowerPoint presentation, I talked about being a magic attack and spin attack. For the purposes of this, I'm just going to say wizard attack and barbarian attack. And again, we're going to assign it more power. So if I come back to my game runner now and I run this, I'm going to get a very different result. Because player, wizard, and barbarian all have attack methods defined in them, when I run this, it's going to invoke the appropriate version. The player object will invoke the player version of attack. The wizard object will invoke the wizard version of attack. And the barbarian object will invoke the barbarian version of attack. But remember, the point of this was that player contained the common type of code that wizards or barbarians could use depending on their state of mana or power, respectively. So the question is, if, if wizard and barbarian have their own version of attack, how do I get how do I access the one in the super class? So we're going to make a little bit of a design change here. We're going to imagine for the sake of our program that we never call attack directly. We're going to call a method called start attack. And what start attack is going to do is it's going to do the following. It's going to check if the wizard has any mana. So if mana is greater than zero, well, that means they have magic. So I'm going to call the attack method else. And actually, I'm going to make an int damage, and we're going to set to zero. Damage equals attack. So essentially, the way this logic is going to work is that we're going to say and start attack. We're going to say that if the player, if the player happens to have, happens to have mana, sorry, if the wizard happens to have mana we're going to invoke the attack method. And because we start looking for the version of the method at the, at the object level, it's going to call the attack inside the wizard class. Makes sense. Now, if, if there's no mana, what's going to happen is we're going to generate some sort of damage based on the attack method defined in the player class. So the question is, how do I call this? A problem here is that if I do this, again, I'm going to call the attack method that is defined in the wizard class. I don't want that. So what I can do is I can use this special command called super. And what super does is super tells the compiler to say to start looking for this method, but don't look at the, don't look at the object class. You're going to start looking at one class above wherever you might be at that time. And this might sound a little wordy in terms of how it's defined, but it actually is important to think about it this way for some reasons we'll explore later. So if I invoke super.attack here, what it's going to do is it's going to start looking for the attack method, but it's going to move up one class before it starts its search. And if we look at our diagram, we know that wizard right above it is player. So what this will do is move into the player class and access the attack method. So now if the wizard does attack something here, the, the way their code setup is that the wizard's always going to do a, a wizard attack because their mana is always greater than zero. So every time we do a wizard attack, we're going to do mana equals mana minus 10. So now, 
Oh, we have to return damage here. So if I come back into my, my game runner now, again, we're not going to do attack. We're going to do w1.start attack. And let's go 4 int i equals 0. i is less than 12. i is equal to i plus 1. We're just going to do a loop for a second here, and you'll see why in a second. Save all, let's just solve our problem. No, it doesn't. Let's take a look here quickly. So what we have here is we have a loop that executes 12 times. I want to do this because I want to simulate the wizard starting their attack 12 times, and you'll see why in a second. Um, and I simply invoke w1.startAttack. So what this does is it goes into the wizard class, invokes this instance method, start attack, and checks. If their mana is greater than zero, we do an attack of type of, of a wizard attack, which is some magical attack that returns a random integer from zero to 19, inclusive. And otherwise, we do just, we attack normally, but in order to access that, we need to use this super command to move up the hierarchy. So now if we come back here, we save all, and we give this a run, we're going to watch this happen. So you'll notice... Wizard attacking, wizard attacking, wizard attacking. So it's looping, and the wizard's attacking over and over again. And then look what happens here. This is when the wizard runs out of mana. So what happens is, in our code, like I said, when the wizard runs out of mana, that means we actually use that super command to call the player version of attack. Now we can do a similar type of thing for the barbarian, and the method's going to look very similar. So let's copy this method. Let's go into the Barbarian class, and let's paste this method in here. But wizard, wizards have mana, and barbarians have power, so we're going to change this to power. And then we're going to come down here, and we're going to say power equals power minus 10. Again, the logic here can be whatever you want, and you would it would be very important to spend a little time thinking about this logic. I'm just making this simple to illustrate the ideas of this super call. And so now if I go to my game runner, instead of having the wizard start attack, we could have the barbarian start attack. You go b1.start attack, I run this, barbarian attacking, 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 and then when we run out of power, which is right here, we invoke that super class, the player class is version of attack. Now I'm going to end this video here. But I'm going to end it with, with a little bit of a problem. And I want you to think about this and see if you can figure out what the problem is here. So remember I said the reference type and the object type don't have to match. Um, but it's important that the, it, well, it has to be the case that the reference type is the same as or a more generic type, a less specific type, we say. So it's perfectly valid for me to say, to give these guys both player references so I can have a player reference and a player object. I can have a player reference and a wizard object, a player reference and a barbarian object, because player is a more generic type. But notice what happens when I do change to have a player reference and a barbarian object. This is a mistake. So in the next video, we're going to start off by talking about why this is an error and how we fix it. I hope this helped.